Our southern resident killer whales are in dangerous waters, teetering on the edge of extinction. In a series of reports, we look at the status of the endangered species, the factors leading to their rapidly declining population, and the efforts of researchers to assess and treat them. Our Environment Northwest team looks at the race to save our orcas. Your heartbeat, your family's heartbeat, our heartbeat. Facing the sailor Sea, Lemmy Tribal Elder Raynell Morris uses this beach near Ferndale, Washington to connect with her ancestors. We love you. We know you're starving. We hear you. To the Lactamish people, southern resident killer whales are family. So what happens to them happens to us. They're starving for salmon. We're starving for salmon. They're unhealthy because of the water. And now we're at an all time point of extinction for them as a population, as a people, as our relatives. The species is made up of three families, J, K, and L pods. L pod, the largest family, has 34 orcas. J pod includes 25, and K has just 15 as of this year. The decline in numbers began in the 1960s, when southern residents were picked out of the waters of Puget Sound. Some of the first organized captures were led by Ted Griffin and his team from the Seattle Public Aquarium. It was completely legal. There were permits issued. Capturers corralled the orcas with speedboats and even bombs, ensnaring some in nets. From the 60s to mid-70s, hundreds of whales were captured in Washington and British Columbia waters. But the southern residents, in terms of you know number of whales and, and the impact on the population, were really hit the hardest. At least 11 died in the process, and 36 were taken into captivity at marine parks. Specifically, young orcas, including Tokate. By 1987, known as Lolita at the Miami Seaquarium, she was already the only survivor of the orcas taken from Puget Sound. Because those captures weren't random, because they were targeted at young individuals, it's not that a third of the population is randomly removed, it's that a generation is removed. Dr. Michael Weiss's team at the Center for Whale Research started tracking the southern resident population in 1976. Researchers roughly estimate there could have been 120 before the captures began, but by 1976, 71 orcas remain. And it, it really took a Washington state level bit of legislation to say that there would be no more killer whale captures within the state. Slowly, the southern resident population rebounded, all the way up to 98 by 1994. Because for a time, their food supply, Chinook salmon, was plentiful. But Chinook stock has declined for decades. Some populations have decreased by as much as 90% since the early 20th century. Chinook were classified as endangered in 1994. So you've got one endangered species relying on another endangered species to survive. The Southern residents received that distinction in 2005. This not only protects the taking of orcas, but puts policies in place to encourage conservationism. As many organizations have joined Morris, and the Lemmy tribe in trying to save the Northwest's beloved whales. We don't have any more time. It's now. It's that urgent, that critical. It has to happen now. Think of it like a trip to the doctor's office. For a southern resident orca, veterinarian Joe Gatos of the Sea Doc Society is among scientists using new tools to better assess orca health and prescribe solutions. For southern residents, it's, it's not are you a drinker, are you a smoker, do you exercise, it's the contaminants that are in your system. How much noise is in the ocean? Is there enough food for you to eat? And what we've realized recently is, you know, do you have any diseases going on? They're building a network of vets and biologists to collect vitals, like a provider would during your yearly physical, and create long-term medical records for each whale, like people and pets have. I would like to see us be able to incorporate all, not just veterinarians, but all of the biologists that know them well. They'll say, I was out taking photographs and this animal didn't look right. Using a drone, they can look at height and weight to see if an animal is skinny, healthy, or pregnant. With infrared cameras, they can check their temperatures for signs of fever. They can look for lesions on the skin, signs of disease, and they can collect breath samples to search for pathogens or abnormal cells. They see symptoms of the problems scientists and the state's orca recovery program are trying to fix. 
I want people to have hope. I want people to know that they live in an, a beautiful environment, but they have to do their part. Pollutants like PCBs have built up in the fish they eat and their blubber. They are directly to newborns delivering a nice dose of toxic chemicals into the milk um, for their newborn calf. So that really impacts survival. They ask all of us to more carefully dispose toxics and are raising concerns about chemicals coming from tires. Another problem is vessel noise, which makes it hard for them to find food or communicate. A new law going into effect in January 2025 will require all vessels to stay 1,000 yards away from them. Giving whales that extra space, we hope, will allow them to be more successful in finding food. Then there's the supply of prey itself. Southern residents only eat fish, mostly Chinook salmon. When there's not enough to go around, they may not starve, but they'll lack nutrition and become susceptible to disease. Gatos hopes action on these issues, along with more medical assessments, will help. So we can diagnose a problem, then we can treat a problem, which is super cool. But he says it's also time to step up funding and enforcement. I think we're in that position now where we've been doing the easy things, and now we need to do some more hard stuff. We owe it to the whales, we owe it to ourselves. They're a part of our collective culture, living in Seattle, living in Vancouver. We have to take care of our neighbors. If we didn't change anything today, given the current circumstances, would we be able to save this population? If we do nothing, we will lose this population forever. Right now, there are exactly 74 southern resident killer whales, a decrease of 24 since the 90s. Around here, they're iconic, so we all get our hopes up when there's a new calf, we all grieve collectively when one dies. We know when the population goes up or down by one individual. Rob Williams, co-founder of nonprofit Oceans Initiative, has devoted his career to studying orcas. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. He says a goal of 2.3% growth per year for 28 years was set, hoping to get the population totals back into the 90s. Instead, over the last 30 years, there's been a decline of 1.5% every year. The Center of Whale Research estimates there were about 98 orcas in the mid 90s to the now 74. So this has been decades in the making? Yes. Why has it taken so long to correct it? Oh, the first problem is that you have to you have to quantify how big the problem is and it takes decades of science. So that's what Rob is doing. He and a team of 17 scientists recently published a study digging into the data to see what the reality of population recovery actually looks like. Williams says of the 74 southern resident orcas right now, about half are female. A portion of those are either too old or too young to reproduce, that leaves about a dozen female orcas carrying the population. With a 17-month gestation period, each would only have a calf every three to five years, and historically speaking, about half of calves die, so they won't all make it. This means that with the assumption that older whales are also dying during this time frame, it would take 50 years to grow the population by 15 to 20 whales. So we have to manage our expectation that we didn't get into this situation overnight and it will take a long, long time for us to recover. This research also looks at the causes of this decline. Williams says the top factor is a lack of food, Chinook salmon specifically. Second, noise contamination. Whales use acoustic sounds to listen for salmon and hunt, too many boats and noises make it hard for them to feed. And third, contaminants like plastic and forever chemicals in the food they do eat. What should we do? Well, the whales are telling us that they need a lot more salmon. This, he suggests, could come down to reducing Chinook salmon harvest, increasing hatchery production, or stopping catching Chinook salmon in the open ocean to leave them for the orcas. What happens if we lose this population? I don't even want to think about losing this population. I can't imagine the Salish Sea, the Pacific Northwest, without our iconic killer whales and Chinook salmon. We've seen this in cases from California to Alaska that if you remove the top predators, um, the lower trophic levels, the system collapses like a house of cards. And that system is our oceans. That's our, that's our Salish Sea. That's what we call home. So it is possible to help. We just have to actually do it. I think the number one thing I want people to learn from this study is that populations have bounced back from much, much more severe genetic bottlenecks than this. And that is the hope. For Environment Northwest, I'm meteorologist Leah Pizzetti.
To see all of our coverage on the race to save our orcas, text the word ORCA to 206-448-4545. For Environment Northwest, I'm Erica Zucco.